I'm gonna let Marilyn, let Marilyn in. We have a few more people. It's good to see everyone. Same here. And I um, hope we had a good, it's been a while. I get, did we meet? I think maybe it was before the high holy days, right? Right. So hope you had a good holidays. Anyway, um, so The Late Comer by Jean Hanif Korlitz. Uh, I always like to start with, you know, what does she look like? And um, let's see, where's that? Uh, so she's 61. So I think some of these are from when she was younger, but, um, and I will read you a little bit about her, none of which will be um, surprising. Um, she was born and raised in New York City. I mean, you had, this was also, I thought, an homage to New York City. Educated at Dartmouth College, Clare College, I've never heard of that. Oh, Clare College, Cambridge. Um, she is the author of the novels, The Late Comer, uh, The Plot, and then um, an adaptation forthcoming from Hulu um, to star Marcella Ali, Marcella Ali. Um, you should have known, adapted for HBO as The Undoing by David Kelly and um, Admission adapted as the 2013 film of the same name, starring Tina Fey, Lily Tomlin, and Paul Rudd, The Devil and Webster, The White Rose, The Sabbath Day River. Um, with her husband, Irish poet, Paul Muldoon, she adapted James Joyce's The Dead as an immersive the theatrical event. Um, and she's the founder of Book the Writer, a New York-based service that offers pop-up book groups where readers can discuss books with the, their offers. You, you know, you can only do that in New York. What can I say? Uh, I, I don't know what pop-up. I We do have authors in Highland Park. I shouldn't say that. And we may have, you know, do a little event for that um, sometime at Macomb. So um, again, um, now we're all assembled, um, you know, tell me what you liked about it. Tell me. Um, and then I have some questions for you. Um, yes, Paula. I did not like the, the hatred between the siblings at the beginning. It is something so foreign to me and it was so pain. It was painful. Yeah. And I also did not like how clueless the mother was. Yeah. I mean, so I agree with both, you know, both of those comments. You know, the whole thing of her relationship with Salo beginning because the other girlfriend mm -hmm. died and that whole um, car accident was obviously um, just a harbinger of what was going to come and his affair with, um, the other woman in the car, whose name I can't remember right now. Um, so uh, the other thing, um, you know, when he was collecting all that art and he put it in, in Red Hook, um, did anyone read, it was The Bee Season by Myla Goldberg? Anyway, there was somebody with mental health issues, the mom, and she would steal stuff and put it in this garage that and it, it was it was not unlike that. I mean, what do you think um, his storing all that art symbolized to him? Paula? Well, that was what he could connect to because he was so traumatized from the accident, obviously he had PTSD. Yeah. And the, and the art touched him in a way that contact with people could not, I think. Although it was only modern art. Only modern art. Andy, go ahead. Oh, wait. Oh, me. All right, Leanne, go ahead. Well, I was reading this book and I was, we were visiting our daughter in New York. And oh. part of the reason I enjoyed it was our son went to school in Ithaca. So oh. <laughs> Ithaca is gorgeous, is true. So I, I could relate to a lot of the things, but I was reading this book and we were, I don't know, I think um, 
shopping in Manhattan one day in a shoe store. And on a table, they were selling some hats and scarves, is this book, and it's entitled Cy Twombly. Cool. And I went, Cy Twombly? Oh I know him! I just read about him. So I opened the book, and sure enough, it's and I looked for the exact picture that was described in the yeah. book. Red swirls and the yellow, mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. And, and he's a very, you know, prominent uh, artist in terms of his style. But yeah. it was so interesting to see this this book. Um, and it, that's not necessarily my taste or my preference with with art, but evidently uh, Salo just you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, there, there's Cy um, Trombley. I you know who who knows what the art it looks piece like scribble. Yeah. Yeah. Well. I, I, and. Um, Millions of dollars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they they've had they had an exhibit at the Art Institute of his several years oh. ago, and that's why the only reason I recognize the name. But every time they would mention another artist, I would look that up, and that was the period where there was a lot of that kind of stuff right. with Jackson Pollock and yes. all those artists that were very, you know, it was very much the emotions that were inside that were coming out, and that he was able to buy into that stuff back then. Right, was really, really what valuable. Was the movie with um, Julia Roberts and she's a teacher and she te takes the kids to see art. And one of them is a Jackson Pollock and it's all, and they're repressed in the 1950s and eventually they get rid of her. I'll look it up, but. Um, I don't know. It sounds like a good movie. It was, it was a great movie. It was a great movie. And I'm, I'll tell you in a hot minute. Um, all right, Andy, did you want to say something? Yes, I think Paula was, you know, hit the nail on the head that he, the father obviously was traumatized by the events of the car accident. And I think this art took the place of relationships for a very long time that he didn't truly really have it with Joanna or his children. Mm -mm. He, he did later on with um, I forget the name of the black, the what black woman in the car. Something with an A. And, and the mother of uh, oh. another child. Right. The art substituted for life for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And maybe perhaps it was because she was part of that, that he was able to connect with her because it seems like he, he really was, you know, even the funeral and everything, he really wasn't connecting with anyone. And then once he realized it was her with the scar, that was when he was able to connect with her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Leanne. I want to go back to something that Paula said too about, you know, what was disturbing in terms of they weren't a family. Um, you know, I had some real strong reactions to that, to the point where I was trying to do research on what is a triplet? <laughs> you know, is it a baby that is born with two other babies with, obviously, they were all different. They weren't in one, one fertilized egg separated. They weren't identical. Right. Um, and how that could be that these three lives who were in utero together, not that they were different, but what was their connection to each other? And I think one of the most powerful things in the book was when they described Joanna sitting on the stairs, looking at the pictures and realizing they were not a family. They were just cohabitating together. That was like, you know, it was kind of like, what defines a family? Is it people who live together? Is it people who have that connection I the, the same I DNA right mm -hmm. I felt bad for her I mean it was kind of like can you imagine a mother feeling that way but I I could relate to that her desperation to have yeah. her kids especially when they went off to college oh maybe they'll have coffee together they'll study mm -hmm. together they'll do this together they'll come home together um and I just and thought it was just such a desperate attempt to pull everything together when it had unraveled from the very beginning when she brought the babies home. Yeah. You know, and well, again, who's the late comer? Yeah. <laughs> it's maybe who's also the narrator. narrator right. And um, is she a 
are they part of quads? Yes. Well, was she yeah. born at yeah. the same time? I know it's a right. fascinating well, kind of created at the same time. Yes. Created yes. Same time. She was the same age as they were, is what she told them. Yeah. Well, you know, I had trouble with this book. Uh, getting into it in the beginning, uh, I found it very difficult reading it. I just didn't enjoy it. And towards the middle, that's when I started enjoying what I was reading. But I also did not like the concept of triplets so far apart from each other because I have a brother and a sister. We're not triplets, but you know, he's older. I'm the middle one and then the younger sister. And we have a very, very mm -hmm. wonderful relationship. So it really bothered me to read that these three people were so against one another. They didn't want to mm -hmm. see each other. They didn't want to talk to each other. They didn't have anything to do with each other. And the latecomer is the one who in the very end brought them all back together right. Right. Uh, that to me was, it was kind of disturbing to to go through this whole book knowing that there was such dissension amongst uh, all the family with the mother yeah. and then the father mm -hmm. too he didn't care about anybody and maybe that's because of the accident it made him the way he was but it was still terribly sad to me that's just my uh, well and and it kind of makes you wonder why were they so antagonistic towards each other? Were they competing for something that they could never achieve? What was it that was really holding them apart this whole time? You know, the, the one who was really bright was always holding it over his brother. And, you know, they just didn't ever really find a place to connect. But that's really the parent's job is to find a place where they could be a family together. Because I do have a friend who's got triplets and they're same IV, IVF back you know, 30 some years ago. And they're very close because they all had similar things that they did together, that the family did together. And because they weren't really a family, it's why everything was so broken. I think, uh, I don't think you can blame the parents for the, what the, because the children from the time they were old enough to know that they had a sibling, they didn't care about one another. They were so yeah. completely independent of one another that they didn't care. They didn't want to have anything to do with each other. And I personally can't relate to that. And like I say, to me, that was very disturbing. Um, I mean that um, Harrison is the one at Cornell, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When Harrison, you know, didn't tell Rochelle that, Sally was his sister. No, no, Lewin. Oh, that was Lewin. Lewin. Sally oh, Lewin. 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 And Harrison, Harrison, Harrison went, went to Roar. Harrison is Roar. the real smug one. Yeah. Yeah. And when that unfolded on Martha's Vineyard, I, oh. I was riveted. Oh. Um, yeah. Wait, Sandy, let me unmute you. Sandy, go ahead. I came from a family of four children, three girls and a boy. And my sisters were 14 and 17 years older than me. We were oh. all brought up so differently <clears throat> in different times of my life, my mother's life. The two older ones were depression babies. And I was the only one that really got anything and was sent to college. The others weren't. And the brother, you know, was totally different. But my mother always said, don't love me, love each other. That's all I ask of you is love each other. And we did, we did. And we all cared about each other and our lives were all very, very different. But we talked to each other regularly and I just couldn't understand that the mother didn't do something about this early on. I, I don't think she had enough love. Right. She Sallow didn't, didn't love her. Mm -hmm. didn't have the um, yeah. She was well, her mother, her I mother was, was such a wait, no, it was the wrong, it was Rochelle's mother that was the one. Because I was thinking, you don't know much about her family, do you, Joanna? Um I, I think it was normalish. Yeah. She had a brother oh. and a sister. <laughs> right. But I think Rochelle's, kind of Rochelle's mother, the hoarder. Yeah. That was Whoa. sad. That was so sad. And again, it's, you know, definitely um, all of it is very, very current, you know, um, IVF, 
uh, you know, the hoarder business. Um, and, I, you know, I, I, the only thing I can tell you anecdotally about IVF kids is that, um, you know, sometimes they're born prematurely. There's, that's why there's so many more twins now because, um, you know, uh, that's how parents are, are having children. And, and, and I have seen, um, and I'd have to look up studies on this, but that they have, you know, some problems, you know, ADHD, ADD, um, some interpersonal skills, whatever it is. So um, I, I wasn't, again, overly surprised at that, but it is very, very sad. And I just, I don't think Joanna, she was, you know, barely capable of, you know, keeping their lives together. And they were so privileged, mm -hmm. you know, this yeah. upper West side and the nanny and the, mm -hmm. the housekeeper, you know, she had everything at her fingertips. And of course, you know, my mother says money can't buy you love and money can't, you know, can't mm -hmm. buy you happiness. And there we have, you know, they had the, the place on, on Martha's vineyard. I mean, when you think about it, you know, Sallow, he came from a very rich family and they had sold away the masters, um, not sold, they donated it so he could get into Cornell. Mm -hmm. And that's another very modern theme that we've seen of, um, you know, we, we've only seen the famous people who got caught, but trying to buy your way into um, the college you want your kid to go to. Um, um, and also, um, you know, Sally uh, being um, a homosexual, being gay, a lesbian, and um, not having anyone to talk about and, you know, not knowing what was happening. And that was, again, you know, a modern trope uh, that um, I, I think that I think it had um, that had a good result. And. I liked her relationship with the antique dealer. Um, and um, at one, although, you know, when you're reading, you're like, you know, please don't hit on her. I, I was, I was worried like it was going to go in a bad way. And yeah, um, because all these other bad things that happened, but you know, that was, you know, she really found herself and she really found um, her passion. And I guess you she finally had a good relationship with somebody right. too. Right. And someone who loved her for her. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes when we, um, you know, I assign these books, you want to, um, I hope that we can like the characters. I didn't always like them um, because, um, and of course, Phoebe, the latecomer, I mean, she really kind of, <laughs> obviously brings that family back together yeah. um, and definitely her. Yeah, definitely. And, and listen, I, um, you have to give Joanna some credit for, for going, for having the baby. Well, I give um, her some credit for having some personal growth later on in life, yeah. but at the very, at, <clears throat> but at the very beginning, like, there's more to making a schedule, to being a mother than making a schedule. I mean, how could you be so clueless and just not see that these kids are not connected at all? And it was a very good portrayal as far as character development. Yeah. We really <laughs> disliked, we all really disliked what was happening. Yeah. Um, Nancy, let me unmute you. Nancy. You said give her credit for having Phoebe. I think she did it vindictively. Oh yeah, she did. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but yeah, it wasn't very altruistic. <laughs> no, not a bit. Right. Uh, but because, was... because the other one had a baby, then she wanted another yes. one. Yes, oh, yeah. Stella, Stella, and, Stella, Stella. Okay, Stella had a baby, and what was going to happen to this? This. Uh, well, it wasn't even a fetus at that point. It was just an egg sitting there. It was an egg. It was an, it egg. Was an egg sitting there. No, I think they're fertilized because oh, fertilized. Fertilized. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. fertilized but, egg. 
but he he was willing to do from the very beginning she had to fight for everything that yeah. she wanted she yeah. fought the the house the the babies she never got pregnant she had to fight him to get yeah yeah everything everything she wanted she fought for and nothing turned out quite the way she expected it to right. yeah well, wasn't, there something, wasn't there something in the the book where she was saying well the three children are off to college and here i am what do i have left to do mm -hmm. so i think that was also part of the reason why right. she wanted to have another child i don't know if she was really maybe she thought kidding. she'd hang on to him better i don't know mm -hmm. yeah well I she knew about the other it. woman too okay at that point mm -hmm. so maybe she felt this could bring them together which i don't think they ever really were together but that's right. a good point no he I, we don't even know if he was in love with the woman who died in the car crash, but he definitely wasn't in love with Joanna. And she didn't even know about the car crash. Well, she did. Oh, yeah, she, she was she at the did. funeral. He was at yeah. the funeral. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Him, I think she met him at the Shiba. Mm -hmm. yeah. she, he was just so guilty about surviving yeah. and whatever. So, yeah, right. Well, that was at the beginning of the book when they say they don't tell where they really met. You know what I mean? They don't tell people that they met uh -huh. again at somebody's um, right. wedding yeah. and they don't mention they met when, you know, her friend um, died in his car crash. Yeah. Um, and it, it it is traumatic, traumatic. Um, let's talk about Harrison for a hot minute. Yeah. Um, is, that, is, that, <laughs> is that college real? Yeah. Yes, yes really? I looked it up. Yes. Oh, really? It's a place. Really? It's oh. a place. Because that was, and um, and Jesse, I don't know if you know this, but I'll put you on the spot. Was that thing he went to real? Yes. Of what? Wait, thing? wait. Oh, the Mormon um, yes. gathering. Yes, yes. that's yes. real. Yeah. Oh. Summer pageant. Yes, very real. Yes, that is real. And the way, and he described it. That's the way. Well, I've never been, but it, yeah, it's yeah. Pageantry. I think, I think one of the funnier there, I think there's a lot of humor in the book. Mm -hmm. And when Rochelle invited Lewin, or Lewin, she did, Rochelle did not invite Lewin, but Lewin invited his um, Latter day Saint roommate and yeah. all these other blind to the Seder for Passover. Mormons oh, came yeah. to the Seder. I thought that was about the funniest scene. Oh, was great. That was, that was very funny. That was very funny. And also the roommate, you know, it was down, he had the, and I don't want to say funny underwear, but he had the Mormon underwear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. All right, Jesse, go ahead. Excuse me, I got to go do something. Okay. I have to right. close my, no, no, I have to close my door because I want to say something about this. Okay. What <laughs> <laughs> called garments? Whoa. Garments. Garments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's very, very near and dear, um, my husband's and uh, live-in caregiver who's been with us, Clara, for over two years, she's Latter-day Saint, and Mormon underwear is for real. It's like garments that... That's what they're called. They're called garments. Garments. And my, my grandparents, my, all my relatives wore garments. And you don't you don't wear sleeveless tops because you got to cover your exactly. garments. Exactly. <laughs> exactly, and you don't want to breach that ever. But the woman who lives with us, she's fine with me like this. It's just, it's a very strict moral code if you live it. Yeah, it wow. it's uh that whole thing. Um, you know, Harrison was just so, um, uh, was it, no, it was Lewin. Uh, no, Harrison. Harrison. Lewin. Uh, Lewin right. was the one who oh, went to the It was Lewin who had uh, the Mormon roommate. <laughs> right. Um, he was so taken with Mormonism and, you know, mm -hmm. I um I, I just thought that was an interesting interlude. And you know, obviously, um, you know, Jean knew enough about that uh to write about it. Um and yes, Roberta. You know, they described um Lewin when he was young 
as um, kind of sad or there was something um, sensitive about him. Mm -hmm. And so when I was reading this whole thing, I think he was just so taken by this, these, the friendship of these Mormon guys and how they mm -hmm. welcomed him because he never had anything like yeah. that. Yeah. It's not like people who grew up with siblings who they laughed and did all kinds of goofy things together. So I think, I think he was on the journey of always trying to figure out there's got to be more than, than, than what I had as a kid. He wasn't angry about it. He just was searching for it, I think. And, yeah. and I, I, you know, and I think, you know, we keep mentioning Harrison. He, Harrison was a real difficult person. Yes. And at, at the very end of the book, you start to see him soften just slightly. Mm -hmm. You know, you start to see some humanity. But where does this little sister, this latecomer, Phoebe, get the get the it's almost like magic fairy dust or something <laughs> to know how to how to her people skills were mm -hmm. intact and yes. good and and her siblings gave her a chance they never gave each other a chance oh yeah it was amazing you know it was very uncomfortable but you know and and we can point out all the things that seem kind of unusual and did they really happen and yes they're very contemporary mm -hmm. But, um, you know, in my family, I'm sorry, there's some really difficult people who don't like their siblings. And it goes back a couple generations. There was jealousy among people. There was, you know, things happened. It's, it, it's just so extreme with these three that I was telling a friend about this book and she kept saying, why didn't the mother do anything? Why didn't the mother do anything? And I think the mother was in such denial too. I mean, all of them were a little broken. Mm -hmm. You know, but, you know, they sent him to this Walden school though, where all they talked about was was what should have been happening at home about how to be a good person and how to care about others and be accepting of others. And it seems like the the triplets didn't get into that, but maybe. Phoebe figured it out and realized what parts of it she was going to use because Harrison totally denied it. I I think that that the how she portrays that school is a slap in the face that they oh, were yeah. too yeah. left that they were you know they didn't talk of you know things of consequence mm -hmm. and you know they had all these you know feel good moments. Leanne. No, I'm glad Roberta brought that up because I, I think I've been uncomfortable with the conversation about putting all the blame on the mother. Wow. Whether she recognized it or not, which I think deep down she did, but she was in denial. You know, let's have your picture taken every, you know, mm -hmm. every summer. On the, um, on the stairs. I don't know that she could have ever done anything about it. The intensity was extraordinary when Sally didn't want to see her brother when she thought she saw him and she literally had to run the other way. Yeah. I mean, I could relate to that in terms of, uh oh, I see this person and I don't want to have anything to do with them. And I'm going to go down the other aisle of the grocery store. But there was, there was such intensity there that I don't I, I really in my heart don't blame her. And I don't think she was going to be able to do much of anything about it. I think Phoebe's success came because she was related to them and yet she wasn't born with them. And for a, what, a 17 or 18 year old, the maturity and her ability to read each person and go to each person and try to manage this totally dysfunctional family. I mean, at the end, you, you do get a better feeling because everybody gets in a better place, including Stella, Selma, I can't remember. Stella, Stella. Yeah. But there was the very last pages because I just finished the book right oh. before. <laughs> so, I mean, to me, the very end of the book is where everybody decided to be like a normal human being yeah. and relate mm -hmm. to each other and be good to each other. But one thing I found missing in the book was they were Jewish, but only saying they were Jewish. They did not have any kind of religious background. There was nothing there that could bring them together with their religion. It's like they were born Jewish and that's it. Nothing was ever made. The parents never did anything to make them have any connection to their religion. And I think that's why Lewin wound, wound up getting uh, so enthralled with the Mormons 
because he didn't have any Jewish background to, you know, reach back and say, well, gee, this is the way I was brought up. <laughs> mm -hmm. There was never anything about that in the whole book. Um, I think Andy was right that the Seder scene is very funny. And, um, you know, he, they put him on the spot. He, you know, can't, he can answer some things, but not most things, um, which I think is typical. And um, Leanne, you're right. I, we shouldn't be blaming the mom. Um, and I, I guess I find the lengths to which the triplets go to avoid each other and that that is, is almost unrealistic. And then that whole thing at Martha's Vineyard, you know, I was cringing. And because um, that was, um, and do you think um, after Sally figured it out, do you think she had any remorse? No. Sally was so mean when, when she, was when so she, angry. she orchestrated that whole thing, yeah. knowing that it was all going to blow up and not only blow up, she was going to hurt people's mm -hmm. hearts. I mean, she was going to do damage that was major and that, I mean, I, I, I hated her for following through. I mean, you know, we get mad at our siblings or somebody and you, you fantasize about something, but the fact that she actually made it happen. And then you talk about the mother being clueless, you know, she caters this whole meal. And <laughs> even when it's happening, I don't think she realizes it's happening. It's it, it was it was tragic. It was horrible. Yeah, Andy. I think it was. I agree with Roberto. It was absolutely horrid. Um, but I think Sally was in love with Rochelle. Oh yeah, oh, yeah she okay. was. I think she, she was in love with her. Yeah, and really couldn't express her feelings, uh, and was jealous of Lewin and didn't know how to, she hadn't really come out yet. And this was just a sick adolescent blow up. I, I mean, when you're reading it, I thought that Lewin and Sally would get along a little bit yeah. because Harrison is just so rough. And then what, when the, did you believe when that whole thing was happening at his school and the name of the boy, Oh, set him up yeah. and it and it turns out that he's not black that was like that's a whole social syndrome and mm -hmm. do, you, do you remember like in the last 10 years there was a woman mm -hmm. i can't remember yes. her name but she yes. was in the news all the time yes because she i yeah. self-identified as being african-american yeah um, what is it she was, um, I think she was in the, she was in some, like the education field. Wasn't it an academic field? And yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, he but, certainly lied about his entire life. Mm -hmm. And that Ephraim found all of this out. Okay? Yeah. yeah. And then how did Harrison react to it? His cool. best buddy, his big friend is a complete, mm -hmm liar about his entire life i mean but, that part so that was eli movie. his name was eli, eli yeah. absalom stone yeah. my okay. maiden name that, so like, <laughs> that sense of superiority yeah not only yeah. to his siblings but like he poo-pooed everybody he was smarter than everybody and right. better than and you and know this is the <laughs> rachel <laughs> oh, yeah. goes out that's who yeah. did it. Yeah. And maybe she I took see. it from that. But um, the kids, <laughs> the kids notes he copied. That was just cruel. Yeah. Cruel. And he was a cruel kid. And then they're going to this, you know, ultra conservative uh, what convention or whatever. And, um, you know, that was also, uh, you know, I didn't like those people and. So it just, they're digging themselves deeper. When he, when he copied those kids' notes, 
And he said he didn't. Did you believe him? Like no, his notes were copied. His yes, notes that's what he said. His notes were cute. copied. Yeah, right, right, and right. I don't I don't know the outcome of that. Who was I yeah. I think because Harrison never um Carlos, what was, Carlos ran Harrison and Carlos met. Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and Carlos said, Well, do you believe me now that right. I did not plagiarize? Yeah. And Harrison said, Yeah, maybe I kind of do. <laughs> well, you jerk. have to believe Carlos after you find out, you know, all of the uh, Eli. <laughs> all right. things Eli did. Yeah. Right. right. And and that I I mean, um, also let me just quickly. Can you imagine the amount of research duplicity to carry this off starting at what age what age was it like he but wrote he a did, book in, he he in high, school. School. high school high school high school like 17 he was recognized i think for his book but they said that he was really actually a little older than that that was also part of his lie mm -hmm. oh. yeah. he was a little older than that when all of this happened when he wrote the book and so forth and so on yeah. I thought that was brilliant in the book, how how they wove that in and then unwove it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, this was a long book. Next book is not as long. And yeah. um, and because I, although we had like an, an extra week, um, and as you know, as I look for books and read books, um, and we've talked about the editing, but, and this is 450 pages. It was a long book, but it was very, very complex. I'm um, Paula. I was gonna say at some point, I thought Harrison and Eli were having a gay relationship. Oh. <laughs> and I, I, thought, I thought at some point that's gonna be a, a you know, <clears throat> a repressed uh, relationship. Right. Because I, I didn't understand how he was at this very, liberal unconventional school and became so conservative and so dogmatic in his thinking other than that he sort of became what we're seeing now with you know white older men who have a lot of repressed sexuality so i thought that's where that was going for a while interesting um and yeah. and also with the professor from school um mm -hmm. i was worried that that not worried but like you know you know those relationships and you know sexual predators on young kids is is very hard it's very hard for me to read and um but you know he was really taken in by that guy who was like a svengoolie i mean he oh. he influenced him not always for the best um this is the movie i did find it um okay. that reminds me of some of this is mona lisa smile Mm, right. And I think that's not, but it, it was with Julia Roberts, mm -hmm. Julia Stiles. It was with a lot of famous people. Um, Kristen Dunst. It, it was it was a great movie. But again, this re repression, I mean, that was from the 50s, early 60s. Um, at least, the, you know, the girls were. Um, being educated, um, although they were really pressured to just get married and then, you know, stay home and, you know, not have a career. And um, so that, but it, it was, it was an excellent, it was an excellent movie. Um, wait, and I have to go back to some notes. Um, Vanessa? Yeah. Go ahead. We're talking about 400 and some. I read the large print version. So there were oh, 696 <laughs> pages. But thank you very much for choosing a book that did come in large. That was excellent. All right. Well, I'm glad it did. Good, good. That must be also heavy, too, Sandy. Very. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is not heavy. Not as heavy as the short story book, though, that you have. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That. Oh, my God. My my wrists are killing me every time yeah. I read it. That one. Yeah, it it that's also a, a very big book. <laughs> it's a very big book. Oh, um, and um, <coughs> um, I I think it's um you know back to Phoebe that she 
Uh, and part three, I think, was I don't want to say the easiest to read, but the happiest to read right. um, because she pulls everybody um, together. She's Speaking also, on, a, yeah, I'm sorry, she's also a generation behind all of them. Yeah. yeah. So she's able to facilitate a different way because she's not there, really, not their peer. Um, the latecomers blending of family history and research explores how generational trauma can change everything, mm -hmm. even for those who don't know about the incident at its center. And I go back to what Roberta says, and we've had a lot of these, um, you know, books where secrets, the way a secret can affect a family, the ripple through the generations, and uh, you can't, you just can't underestimate it. And, you know, like even when the kids were at Cornell, like why were they lying? You know, why were they saying, you know, Lewin knew they knew each other, Sharon? Well, so, I mean, that's what was modeled at home from the very start. You know, they had this dad that was there but he wasn't there and it said the kind you know his questions to them what did you do at school or tell me about your test but there wasn't any ever it didn't sound like there was like any real dialogue and then he would be out later and later at night and that's how the three of them all grew up with no no model of adults you know but sometimes kids overcome that with their friends at school Whereas Phoebe, he was out of the picture. So she just had her mom to talk oh, to. It, it was a totally different situation where she grew up, where maybe she had an adult that talked with her. I mean, she still kept secrets, but at least it was um, conversation. Yeah. I don't know. That, that was my thought. I mean, it, it was just a totally different family she grew up in. Yes, agreed. <clears throat> um, Merle. I love the way Phoebe described herself as being existentially defrauded. That was the expression she used because she didn't have her father around and she never had a young mother. So the, the only mm -hmm. mother she had was the mother who's on a different floor and they're ordering a different food for dinner. And it was just sad. Mm -hmm. But her sister had chosen the name Phoebe because she liked the pH that it's, it reminded her of the word Phoenix, like rising out of the fire and being right. reborn and all that. So I thought yeah. that was really nice that Phoebe actually ended up doing, it was almost prophetic that she named her that because she was the one who brought the family back together. Um, and what about Phoebe's relationship with Stella's son? Mm. Is that realistic? I mean, mm. I know this is a book of fiction, but... <laughs> Yeah. that's that's her half brother it was convenient it was convenient yeah. you know you know the book we read about um and i think it was a true story um uh, written by i think the woman rabbi or she finds out that she her father that raised her was not right. the biological father and oh, no, right that's her oh, donor that's Annie. that's Danny, that's Danny shapiro one. and right. she's yeah. not a rabbi um she's she's actually a writer Yes, but I think that about was a, that's a true story. And I think I just learned that my daughter in law found out that she has a brother that she never knew she had. Mm -hmm. Now, my daughter in law is 41. And um, so they just learned about this man. He's uh, four or five years older than she is. And everybody seems okay with it. So I think half brother or full brother? Half brother, probably. Half brother. Half brother. And how yeah. did they, did they find out through these DNA tests? Yeah, well, it was, um, somebody did, um, what? 23 and 23 me. 23 yeah. and me. Yeah. Yep. And they, yep. and they found each other. I mean, my daughter-in-law wasn't the one who did it. Someone else did it and then shared it with other people. But how did they find out about, they'd have to have her DNA to know that they're a match. They found somebody else's DNA in the family. Oh, and, and and uh, and I don't quite know how all this works, but right. whoever they found um, <clears throat> continued to do the research or had done previous research. So I mean, we Roberta, Roberta, yes. Roberta, was he given away? You know, was he given away? Um, 
adopted you know what i so here's something i don't know i don't know if the father of this man who is my daughter-in-law's father who has passed away ever even knew about this baby mm. i would say no. probably not I don't, you know, I don't know. Possible he didn't know. Roberta, did you ever hear the story? You know, Joel is adopted and his birth mother through 23 and me. Do you remember Steve and Sue Sickle? Yes. Steve Sickle is Joel's birth mother's first cousin. Um, Can you and for those that? for those just joining into this story, <laughs> they were all part of Lakeside. Yeah. So they all went to shul together. Yeah. So here are my parents, good friends with Steve and Sue Sickle, never knowing that their baby is related to Steve Sickle. Steve Sickle is Joel's biological aunt, uncle. Did, did the Sickles know it? No. St no well, no. Steve knew because Steve gave his family tree to Joel years ago. And he said, yeah, I kind of recall that. My cousin Trudy had some trouble in college her freshman year. And yep, Joel was that trouble. So Vanessa's question was, <laughs> do you think that's realistic? Um, and I'm learning these stories. I like mean, that. I have a friend that I taught with forever who just found out that her husband, who has since passed away, um, had a child before she even knew him. And and he has four biological children that he raised. He's, he was divorced and they're all friends. They just met this guy about two years ago and they all hang out together now. Yeah. I so. think with the DNA test, it's just gonna become more and more, um, yeah. you know, there'll be just more and more stories. Uh, and I, I also think, um, you know, having, a child out of wedlock is there's not the same type of stigma. I think right. that, you know, having a child not, you know, bef uh, you know, it, you know, kids don't get married or whatever, all of that stuff um, is more common. And, and now with the DNA, you know, what's what, what was, oh, the book um, last, last month's book, the same thing with the Golden Hotel when she had the affair with the pickle guy. Oh, right, 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 right. right. <laughs> How many yeah. times can yeah. we read this? You, you know, know yeah. Phoebe was uh, such um, a glowing personality compared to the rest of the family. So oh. to her, having this other brother was really not such a terrible thing. Right. Yeah. And he mm -hmm. seemed like a lovely kid. Yeah. And maybe... You know, he grew up with the love of his mm -hmm. mother and father, and maybe yeah. Sallow uh, was able to Mother. parent him, mm -hmm. you know, and loved him. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I Again, um, it, getting back to the Golden Hotel, they didn't, they weren't running DNA tests, but she knew because he had, she had a rash that mm -hmm. like the father had, which I thought was that, you know. <laughs> Go get the DNA test. Like, <laughs> yeah, we can. We know how to do this now. You don't have to go on some show and like, who's the father and, and all of that. Um, and um, I, I, so I do. I'm so. I wish Gail Sullen would have come on and her friend. Um, I and and I don't think Gail wanted to read it, so I'll have to find out. Um, and oh, we're recording. I'm sending it to Gail. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Gail. And, and I think at the end there, um, well, it's definitely happier. And I, I guess we like them more, right? Well, they became more humanized. They became yes. more humanized, yeah. Right. yeah. Mm -hmm. right. And that's what the author did. She made them human. <laughs> right. mm -hmm. And do we think that Lewin and Rochelle get back together? Oh, totally. yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Right, 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 right. That was the very end of the book. They got married. <laughs> so that's just the super happy ending. Right. Yeah. After all the misery, I mean, it would be yeah. nice to have a happy ending. Yeah. Uh, Merle. Hey, something that Phoebe said, it's it sort of the beginning of this, the beginning of this section where she starts talking about who she found out these secrets. She found out her mother had this hidden art collection, things like that. She said that privilege and tragedy are a perfect storm for any adolescent. 
I was thinking about privilege and tragedy is a really interesting concept because people think, well, people of privilege don't have any tragedy or don't suffer, but this shows they do, they do. And, and, and the fact of being privileged, one of the characters said that Phoebe's generation marinated in guilt because if they did have a lot of money, they thought they shouldn't, that it wasn't fair, that everybody should be equally poor or something that, you know, is a very bad concept for our, uh, you know, time in history. We don't want everybody to be poor. But he said that her generation is marinated in guilt. I just wondered, did you agree with that? that um, I certainly have seen evidence of that. Uh, we had a family at Legacy Lakeside. Um, they're no longer members. Um, and they were very privileged and their kids um, like went out of their way to, um, you know, like live in crummy apartments and, you know, downplay the wealth that they had grown up with. When you and, talk about privileged families, look at the Kennedys, all their money, and they had more tragedy in that one family than yeah. how, how many families <laughs> together. I mean, that was unbelievable. Yeah. Whether you like them or not, it was just the idea. Yeah. <clears throat> this is from a review. This is a novel that focuses on family dysfunction. I agree. High art society, <laughs> privilege, race, and secrets galore. The Oppenheimer family are Jewish. So for those not familiar with the Jewish religion and traditions, you will learn some. The latecomer is a slow burn that if you can make it through until Phoebe takes off, then you're set. I mean, they do... I think the Jewish parts, because we're all Jew, we know what a Jewish funeral is. We know what Shiva is. We know what a Seder is. So though we don't, you know, we, we, we just internalize it. And if you weren't Jewish, those things you, you would have to learn. So, yeah. 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 Um, uh, although, I, again, I think that the, um, the beginning, you have to read that so you know what was happening at the end. So, um, and yeah, um, and I and I I I I I do think about it. You know, s certain books, different things. You know, um, the Danny Shapiro book, but um, you know, this IVF and her disconnect and uh, how um, you know, her Joanna is searching for this ideal family. And, um, you know, I, I do think she finds happiness with Phoebe. Don't you think she does? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And at the very end, she finally can see her children getting closer together and yeah. actually in liking each other. And I think that brought her a lot of happiness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's Agreed. at the very end. That's at the very end. And she obviously wanted company and she wanted the love of her children. She didn't have a loving marriage. No. So, you know, she unfortunately didn't know how to get the things that she wanted the most desperately. No. Mm -hmm. I mean, the one thing you have to say about Sallow is that he gave her everything monetarily. Yeah. Which does not make a happy marriage. But no. You know, at least we weren't mad at him for cutting her off, not giving her money, making her move, uh, whatever. So, so that was yep. uh, a redeemable quality of his. <laughs> and don't you think it's interesting? Yeah. Wait, and yeah, don't you Paula? think it's interesting? That, I'm sorry. Don't you think it's interesting that the artist he chose is Twombly? Turn people into buildings that they weren't even. Right. Yeah. Wasn't the, the other artists, the one that she liked. Wasn't interested yeah. in art that mm -hmm. depicted people. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it, it depicted mm -hmm. structures. So he just was very disconnected. By the way, if you're ever in Ithaca, the Johnson mm -hmm. Art Museum at Cornell is really, yeah. really a wonderful art museum. Huh. Um, I've been there several times. It has a view. If you go, you know, it, in the fall, the view of the the trees. I've never seen anything like that because it's high up. You can look out the window and you yeah. overlook the whole um, oh, city of Ithaca. But it's it's a small art museum, 
um, I mean, I could picture the whole thing when he was hiding in that little room when the guy first mm -hmm. came. And oh yeah, um, it's mm -hmm. it's an interesting place. Yeah. Mm. Oh. yeah. Um, I do. Before we go, I want to tell everybody a little bit about um, Sunday morning. Yay! Um, we are in person. I thought I brought up the. Person and virtual, both. Yes, yes, yes. It'll be streaming. Um, it'll be streaming. And, um, oh, it's going to take me. All right, just give me a hot minute here. I'm trying to find this. Um, but it... it, it First of all, it is not going to be recorded. Um, this guy is an artist and, um, you know, he, I, I, whatever it is, I, I, I get it. Um, but it's called The Suitcase and his name is Tim Lorsch. And his, a suitcase from his family in the Shoah um, finally was delivered to him. And it, you know, had things and he's made a one man show about um, the suitcase and his family. And I, it's going to be really, really interesting. Um, he it, it came to me through Jim Schuster. Um, and I, I know that everyone is going to. Um, oh, here we go. Here we go. Vanessa? Yeah. Didn't, wasn't there a movie, The Suitcase? I thought I showed a film like that at Solel some years ago. I don't know. But this is from 2016. A suitcase was found in a little antique store in the Czech Republic and miraculously made its way to Tim Lorsch um, in Nashville, Tennessee. The suitcase had the name Julius Israel Lorsch um, inscribed in it. It was his great uncle and he performs... And um, this has been partially funded by the Spungen Foundation, and it tells his family story dating back to the Holocaust. 10 o'clock start time, come at 930 for that, the delicious lox and bagels. Um, there was a movie called The Suitcase. I just Googled it, but I don't I don't know much about it. So yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll have to look. I have to look. What's the yeah. next book? It's so well. Oh, the next book. Yeah. Yeah, thank, you guys have to keep me on the straight and narrow. Um, mm -hmm. Wait, where I, I, oh no. Wait one second. There it is. And when? Well, that we need to talk about. Um, and I will send this all out tomorrow. But um, the man who sold Air in the Holy Land, and it's supposed to be very delightful. Um, I think it's stories, um, and I'm still reading it. So, you know, if we're going to focus on some, I will let you know about that. Um, it's about Israel. So um, I think, and it's by Omer Friedlander. Now, um, you know, so this is November. December gets challenging. Um, um, it's not as long. Ugh. Like December 22nd is Hanukkah. Then people, December 15th is too early. Um, are people going away? Not me. <laughs> but December 15th too early. Yes, but this is virtual. So right, right, right. I well, December 15th is only three weeks, it's only two weeks away. Oh. oh. That's I mean they can Today well, it's no, it's November. 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 November 3rd. Right. <laughs> okay, so how about, let me go back now. Okay. Oh, how what's about wrong with the 22nd? What's wrong with the 22nd? It's, it's Hanukkah. I know it's Hanukkah, but. Uh, you know, people like to light the candles, whatever. But we got the 15th. Yeah. So we have yeah, plenty of time. Fifteenth is good. Yeah, let's get a shorter it. book. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. I can't do that one, but that's okay. Oh well, we'll miss you. And the man who her. sold what? The man who sold air in the Holy Land. And I want to. How recent the man is who it, sold Vanessa? Air. Um. Let 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 let's go to the. Let me see here. 
It is, you don't have to get it at Amazon. Um, I, I haven't been able to um, find it on, um, on audio. I do some stuff on audio. And uh, let's see, read more. Um, you think the libraries would have it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. Um, oh, it's from April 12, 2022. Oh, that's new. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. Um, but uh, you have, I, yeah. Tell them to get it. <laughs> so yeah. sometimes, they, sometimes they're very good about this. And, uh, you know, I think this would be very popular for them. Hardcover. Is it in paperback? Oh, yeah, it's in paperback. It's cheaper in hardcover. It's at oh. the library. Interesting. Is yeah. it? Okay. It's at the library. Yay. All right. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank uh, you. Tomorrow night. Oh, is a sharing Shabbat. Um, but next week is um, Veterans Shabbat. And I know, um, David, I hope, uh, David, Sandy, I hope you and David can make it. And I, I will just tell you, I asked people to sign up and um, one woman um, emailed me and she said, you know, her husband was in the military. I said, first of all, you're the youngest person on the list. Like she's got kids in the religious school. I said, and second of all, you read um, my Macomb at home all the way to the end. <laughs> and you emailed me, said you get two doubles, two golden stars for being so compliant. So um, anyway, uh, I hope we see everybody. Um, and, and there's a lot, there's just so much going on. If you need any clarifications, let me know. Thank, Thank you. you. This was Thank a great you. Book. Thanks. Thank okay. you. Thank, Thank I you hope I see you on Sunday. Come Sunday. Be well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.